go. So hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. And I'm sure there are a couple of folks tuning in um, from overseas in the UK. And for those folks, good evening. Um, my name is Eric Story. I'm the Outreach Manager at the Laurier Centre for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies in Waterloo, Ontario, as well as a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Wilfrid Laurier University, also in Waterloo, Ontario. Now, I and the rest of the folks at the Laurier Military Centre would like to welcome um, you all to the first event um, in our fall lineup of the speaker series this year. Um, of course, welcome to those who have been tuning in since the very beginning, perhaps even before we went virtual for the first time last September. Um, and also new faces. We always love to see new people coming. So um, welcome to those for the first time. Um, but before I begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Military Center resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. In 1701, this land fell under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, a treaty that was part of the Great Peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars of the 17th century. It represented and continues to represent today an eternal agreement to not only share and protect resources, but also solve conflicts peacefully. 80 some years later in 1784, the Haldeman Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown following the American Revolution. And the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from just north of Orangeville today to its source at Lake Erie. Today, this treaty territory remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities, as well as the home of many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and acknowledging their presence in the past and present reminds everyone of the responsibilities we all hold as treaty people. Now, today I'm really excited um, to introduce our speaker, and I think this is one of the reasons why I get so excited about being able to broadcast virtually, is that we're able to bring in people from so many different places that we just weren't able to do before. Normally, we would draw people mostly from within Canada or perhaps some from south of the border, but again, close to our Waterloo location. But because of this virtual environment, our ability to literally connect with people worldwide, I was able to connect uh, earlier this spring um, with a very interesting um, and well-known scholar in the UK named Joy Porter. Now, Joy Porter is the Leverhelm Major Research Fellow and PI of the Treated Spaces Research Group at the University of Hull in the UK, and you can find some of that work at treatedspaces.com, where she researches Indigenous, environmental, and diplomatic themes in an interdisciplinary context. She's fascinated by the mind, by what makes us love, persevere, transcend, and escape the legacies of conflict, and her work exposes ultimately how culture impacts the world. And I will turn it over now to our speaker for tonight, um, or this afternoon, I should say, Joy Porter. But just briefly before I do turn it over to Joy, um, I would like to remind folks, for those who may be tuned in a little bit later um, and weren't able to see the PowerPoint that was on, that was playing before we went live, uh, we have Joy Porter's newest book, Trauma Privet. Trauma, Primitivism, and the First World War, The Making of Frank Pruitt, available at bloomsbury.com for 35% off using a discount code that we have. Don't worry, you don't have to remember all of that stuff. I will make sure to include it in the chat at the bottom of your screen. But if you enjoyed today's, if you enjoy today's presentation, uh, which is actually going to be based on that book that I just mentioned on the life of Canadian soldier and poet Frank Pruitt, We'd really encourage you to make a to, to make a purchase tonight because you're not going to be able to find it for much cheaper anywhere else. Anyways, I've already said too much. Um, let me turn it over to our speaker for this afternoon and for those folks overseas this evening, Joy Porter. Joy, take it away. Thank you so so much, Eric. That was great. I really really appreciate it. I'm just gonna briefly share my screen with you. Hopefully this will work and then we can get started. <laughs> 
I hope you're seeing that well and it's all fine. Looks so, good, Joy. It's good? It's good. So, I just wanted to say thank you, Eric, and thank you, patrons of the Laurier Military Center. I really appreciate you inviting me here tonight. And it's lovely that we can share so intimately from across the waters like this. It's really lovely. And this is new research. So it's nice for me to share stuff that's just come out and it's a new book. And it's a, a Canadian who's being brought back to life as it were from the First World War. And the book's just come out in May. So it's, it's just a lovely chance to, for me to learn from you really, because I'd love to know what you think once you've heard this story, once you've thought about it from a Canadian point of view, because that's what I can't really have. If you're wondering where my strange accent comes from, I'm from Ireland. Uh, from Derry, Donegal, on the border between the north and south of, of Ireland. Um, so, there, and there's a long tradition of, of exchange between Canada and, and where I'm from. And uh, this story is, is a story of someone who's also um, fallen in love uh, across the pond, I suppose, with everything to do with, with, with Britain after the war. So, this is the story of someone who's very Canadian, I think. It's a new story. It hasn't been told before in book length form. And there's new um, archives that, that I found in Scotland. And I've brought all, a lot of archives together that hadn't been brought together before because he knew so many people. Now, I think there's about six main reasons why he's fascinating. I mean, it took me about 10 years to write this book, so obviously... I'm really interested in Frank Pruitt. And I'm going to just go through them, all six, quite quickly. Uh, and there's going to be some movies and there's going to be some discussion. And I really hope that you're going to share your thoughts with me at the end, uh, because I'll be absolutely fascinated and really grateful to hear them. This is a picture of Frank Pruitt. Uh, painted by Dorothy Brett, by Dora Carrington, 1922. And as you can see, he's exceptionally attractive. And that central fact guided his whole experience through the First World War. Uh, he looked in the image of uh, the movie Indian of the era. And this, this haunting good looks that he had are, are something I want you to keep keep in mind. So I think really there's six main reasons why Frank Pruitt's really important and interesting. I think he's someone who alters and deepens how we understand the First World War and its post-pandemic aftermath, which we're also living through, the aftermath of a pandemic. And he's someone who I think speaks to our times rather than his own He's someone who very far, far thinking and who thought in terms of deep time. So I think that's very interesting. Because his story touched upon so many different areas, I took an interdisciplinary approach to understanding Frank Pruitt. So I blended military history, I blended uh, conventional history, and, and reliance on archives, with talking to his surviving relatives, with looking at his poetry, with putting him in literary context. I looked into psychology of, of trauma because he's profoundly traumatized. And also I have an anthropological background. So um, looking at this in terms of um, ideas of primitivism was uh, fairly second nature to me. So it's an interdisciplinary book. And it's a book that's uh, telling a relatively new story in new ways. So hopefully that, that should be um, a new access point to the First World War and to shell shock. Now, I don't know how much you may know already about shell shock, but um, it's fascinating uh, and it, very much guides Pruitt's life 
after he's experienced the First World War. And I have a little image, a little video here uh, of soldiers digging trenches. And Pruitt's experience is very much in the trenches. And he is someone who doesn't shy from combat. And he's, he's very much at the heart of a war of attrition. A war of attrition is, is often when you have asymmetries uh, in combat, when there is um, large technological forces, nothing you can do but, be, but take on this kind of troglodyte existence where you're digging in for protection, not unlike a little animal might do. And Pruitt is, is living that life for prolonged periods. And that's what really causes him such psychological uh, trauma. So I just wanted to give you a flavor uh, of what it was like uh, at the time. So here he is when he's just joining up, beginning of the story. And he grows up an Ontario farm boy uh, in a middle class farming community with a fire and brimstone kind of Protestant Ontario grandfather. He's born 1893 and he grows up a settler on Haudenosaunee territory. And Indigenous children from the nearby uh, residential school were making fairly regular escapades in the region where Pruitt grew up. And he was exposed to Indigenous culture on varying levels. He knew about, for example, Tom Longboat, which some of you might have heard of, the famous Onondaga Haudenosaunee Olympic marathon runner, at the time one of the fastest long distance men on earth. He joins up, Pruitt does, in 1914, and he has dreams of making Canada a nation on the world stage. And he writes fairly flowery, um, conventional poetry before he experiences combat that talks about Canada, um, you know, maturing and, and taking its, its position. Remember, Canada only becomes a self-governing entity, as you'll know, in 1867 just 44 years before all of this, this combat begins. When he reaches the trenches, he's at the worst points, really, that he could be in terms of combat. He's at Passchendaele, he's at the Somme, he's at the Second Battle of Ypres, he's at Vime, that, that, that battle so often held up as the coming of age battle for Canada. He sees a lot of death. And it affects him really profoundly. It also affects this chap on the right, Siegfried Sassoon, who he meets very soon after he has to be invalided out. And we're going to hear more about him very soon. Various things happen to him while he's fighting. And probably the first thing I'd like to communicate to you is that he becomes inured to violence. Violence becomes something that he um, makes friends with, as it were. And this poem, Card Game, is one of those poems that um, expresses that. It's written in the same way that I think that Ernest Hemingway wrote Great Art, in the sense that it gives the reader just the top 10% of meaning. The uh, Hemingway talked about just showing the tip of the iceberg to the audience, the bit of the iceberg that's visible above water, and leaving the reader, the audience, to make peace themselves with the wider meaning that is within the artwork. And the same thing is within this poem here by Pruitt. He's asking you to put yourself in his boots and understand what it's like to deal with death on a constant basis. So this is a Canadian actor who very kindly the British Library uh, paid to record this poem. 
uh, uh, when it was when the book was first launched at the the British Library a few months ago. Uh, his name is Alex McMoran, and he's going to read the poem for us. And I think he does a wonderful job of expressing it in a Canadian voice. Um, so I'll, I'll just press play and let you hear it. Car came. Hearing the whine and crash, we hastened out and found a few poor men lying about. I put my hand in the breast of the first man. His heart thumped, stopped, and I drew my hand out wet. Another, he seemed a boy, rolled in the mud, screaming, My legs, my legs, and he poured out his blood. We bandaged the rest and went in and started again at our cards where we've been. So the the question Pruitt is asking you to ponder is what place emotionally must he have been at in order to not miss a beat with his card game and instantly start again after experiencing and being with men in the throes of death. So immediately you grasp how much Pruitt is not shying away from trauma. He's actually asking his audience through poetry to ponder it and to fight the psychological battle with him that goes alongside combat in the trenches. So he's asking us to go with him into that darkness um, that accompanies being with profound violence, which I think is unique uh, that in, in all the annals of, of, of poetry produced uh, around this period. That's the absolutely unique and very uh, wonderful Canadian contribution to understanding combat, war, violence, and in particular, what it meant to fight in 1914. I consider Pruitt a very significant uh, poet of modern trauma. And I think it's only now in the 21st century, having lived through the Freudian revolution, I think, that we're really able to begin to understand what he was writing about. Uh, two primary events had traumatic impact on him. First of all, he's thrown from a horse uh, after an explosion early in 1916. He recovers after a year in hospital in the UK, but then he suffers all his life from really excruciating, at times, back pain. But the second event is the one that really sent him into another psychological place. A really profoundly psychologically traumatizing event in April 1918. Pruitt is buried alive as a result of an explosion, artillery fire. And when you're buried alive, it's physically traumatic and mentally probably even worse. Physically, every muscle and sinew is strained against the dark weight of soil crushing the bones and the ribs. Your lungs fill up, the eyes bulge out, the tongue turns blue and the psychological impact of being buried alive. Well, frankly, it's hard to underplay it. It's so terrible. Sigmund Freud said it was the ultimate subversion of the repression that allows all of us to function. You know, there's certain things we repress all the time just to allow us to interact with people and not, you know, fully express ourselves in every fleeting um, desire. Freud basically said that being buried alive is an explosion of the mind. It, 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 it blows up all the archaeology of repression that allows us to function. 
and Prude ends up profoundly shell-shocked. And this little view is one of the surviving records we have of profoundly shell-shocked men. And it takes uh, its most obvious corporeal expression through shaking and uh, jarring movements of the limbs, uh, flared eyes in, in uh, heavy dil dilation of the pupils, uh, and just a terror that the body continues to remember and play out. So I will play this little video for you and you get a sense of uh, people from the time who experienced the kind of trauma that Pruitt went through. These are all patients uh, recuperating. There's the staring, uh, permanently terrified eyes um, of, of the traumatized man, the shell-shocked man, as it was talked of at the time. Um, nowadays, we talk about PTSD, but it's not, it doesn't quite map onto shell shock, uh, but uh, it's another um, malady of, of combat. So for Pruitt, what being blown up does for him is that he completely lets go of the veil between the living and the dead. Pruitt thinks that, the, that he's dead whilst alive. He thinks that the dead are all around him and he can see them and they're interacting with him in various states of decomposition. He goes to various hospitals or sent to various hospitals, including Clay, Craig Lockhart, which is fairly famous. It's been represented in movies and so on. This is age 24, um, July 1918. And then he goes to Leno. August 1918, and it's while he's in this profoundly traumatized state, he's, you know, he's seeing the dead, he's living with the dead at all times, that he has this psychological break and becomes indigenous, not a word that was common at the time, he thinks of himself as Indian, and he, he really takes on an identity and and he has a combat name which is Toronto Pruitt but he takes on the self and tells people he's Iroquois or Mohawk uh, and and he acts the cinematic version of what it is to be uh, indigenous at this time and if you look at this picture here you can see those shell shocked eyes you can see that prolonged sense of, of fear while he's at the hospital though he meets that chap uh, in the previous slide Siegfried Sassoon who's a very rich and uh, talented poet in some right and Sassoon adopts him and takes him on as uh, an object of of intimate patronage, shall we say. Suzun is homosexual, uh, not overtly so at this period, but he, he is. And he writes kind of love poetry um, to Pruitt and, and sees in him this mixture of primitivist, uh, the primitivist ideal, and also the quintessence in Pruitt of the great poet. And of course, uh, so soon as quite a lot of money, and that must have been attractive to Pruitt, who's, who's penniless and profoundly psychologically distressed. Here's another picture of Sassoon later in life, when he's kind of graduated beyond his um, various love affairs in just after the war. Um, he has an interest in a close friendship with uh, Wolf Owen uh, in some ways Pruitt is uh, the successor in his affections to Wilfred Owen and then eventually um, Sassoon meets uh, arguably the love of his life Stephen Tennant who's this amazing person that he, he becomes um, very intimate and close with in the late 20s and of course they're aristocrats so um, many of the um, 
the boundaries that are very harsh for others don't apply uh, to them. What Sassoon sees in Pruitt is a Canadian, an Indian, and an Indigenous person, but fundamentally a wonderful poetic talent. And uh, what he likes is poems like our game, but also poems like this one, which is called Kelso Road. Now, I characterize this as one of Pruitt's walking poems. I call them walking poems, where Pruitt would inscribe onto the land what he was feeling in his heart and his emotions. So um, you kind of walk in the poem as Pruitt walks and everything takes on the same, the landscape takes on the emotional significance that Pruitt comprehended. Thing about his walks when he's writing in this period is the dead are everywhere and palpably so he sees them, he understands them to be there. And again, this is Alex McMorrin, uh, the Canadian actor who's now over in the UK. He's going to read this, it's called Kelso Road, a famous, I think, uh, Pruitt poem. The Kelso Road, morning and evening are mine and the bright noonday, but night to no man doth belong when the sad ghosts play. From Kelso town I took the road by the full flood tweed. The black clouds swept across the moon with devouring greed. No peace to tread the night I felt above my head, blowing the cloud's edge Faces wry in pale fury spread. Twelve surly elves were digging graves beside Black Eden Brook. Twelve dug and stared at me, but one read in a book. In Bergen, trees and hedges rocked. The moon was drowned in black. At Hersel Woods, I shrieked to find a fiend astride my back. His legs he clothed about my breast, his hands upon my head till cold stream lights beamed in trees, and he wailed and fled. Morning and evening are mine, and the bright and heat, but at night the sad thing ghosts for their revels meet. So when this book was first launched, it so moved um, a series of artists. Uh, one of them, uh, Mary Hebert, Herbert, wrote, uh, produced this painting. If you're interested in um, purchasing it or seeing any more of her work, um, Pruitt and this series of paintings are discussed in the Signal House edition. Uh, artists um, uh, publication, which is online, just Google the Signal House edition and you'll find her work. And that's that's Pruitt and that's her representation of this poem, Kelso Road. It's very much a poem in keeping with how many experienced shell shock. It was worse at night and Pruitt feels it most when he is foolish enough to walk in the darkness when shapes can be half discerned and he sees himself being hag ridden and very much having to live face to face with the dead. There's many more poems I could talk to you about um, at length, but I just wanted to, to, to share with you tonight two of his strongest poems. There's a series of other ones that I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, maybe we can talk about them um, at the end. Another reason I found Pruitt so interesting uh, was from an anthropological point of view. He is treated for shell shock by uh, a man called the Father Confessor, W.H.R. Uh, Rivers, um, at C Craig Lockhart Hospital for officers uh, just in the outskirts of Edinburgh. And um, Rivers has such an impact on so many men at the time that were experiencing trauma 
because they felt he was capable of somehow reaching into their psyche and helping them. Sassoon, the patron that Prude ends up with, uh, who's also suffering from shell shock, he described Rivers as being able to light fires in the forest of the mind, that somehow Rivers was able to reach in there and help these fundamentally terrified men. Um, there was um, a Booker Prize winning series of novels that heavily feature Rivers, by the way, by Pat Barker. Um, but what interests me about Rivers was that he transposed all of his anthropological ideas about primitive people uh, onto the, the his, his shell shock uh, lightly Freudian approach uh, to helping shell-shocked men. And in, in ways, um, it, it's almost like two sorts of mythologized thinking, meeting each other, Pruitt um, inventing himself as indigenous, and Rivers applying a set of primitivist ideas that are equally flawed and equally um, not based in fact. There's a real irony because uh, Rivers, when he meets Pruitt, he uh, has just got back from the Torres Straits where he's been looking at um, indigenous peoples. And he was trying to find out out there whether they had better sight as a compensation for their lack of intelligence, which he presupposed. And I'm, I do wonder in the book, what it must have been like for Rivers to meet someone who was so clearly articulate and intelligent and, and, and erudite, who was also saying that they were um, indigenous and not only that, a creative person, a poet. And that juxtaposition between uh, Rivers, the anthropologist, and Pruitt, the shell-shocked Canadian, who thinks, feels he's indigenous, uh, allows us to rethink Rivers, who's really kind of been worshipped a little bit um, for rather a long time um, through novels and movies and, and in military psychiatry to some, some extent. Um, Rivers, after all, studied beliefs such as the primitive peoples, I quote, those who live in a state of nature, the less advanced races, have superior eyesight, but inferior or higher mental development. So there's a whole matrix of primitivist ideas uh, that, that Pruitt allows us to, to look at in the shell shock treatment of the time. I have a whole chapter on that. Uh, and it, it allows us to look at, at, this, at this figure, rivers, and that shell shock treatment and the the whole spectrum of it from electric shock therapy, Faradayism, Faradism, uh, all the way to the more benign forms that Pruitt experienced um, psychoanalysis from people like Rivers, who, who was uh, right at the forefront of the beginning of, of psychiatry in, British, in Britain. Another reason Pruitt's really interesting is because he's an imposter. And it helps him when he takes on this Iroquois identity, this Mohawk identity from about 1918 onwards. It helps him to be an absolute social smash hit. He's, as we said at the beginning, smolderingly good looking. And he reminds everyone of the biggest star of the time, Rudolf Valentino. And he plays it up terribly. He runs around. Uh, the stately home where he uh, finds himself a per, 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 almost permanent guest for several years. Garsington Manor, it's called, the home of Lady Ottiline Morell, the daughter of a thousand earls. Now, one of the rich, she's from one of the absolute richest families in Britain, the Cavendishes. And she falls for Pruitt um, because, you know, he has movie star good looks. And Pruitt plays up the whole indigenous thing. He goes around topless on a sienna colored horse, um, trying desperately to express his inner indigenous poetic soul. 
in various ways. And everyone ends up really convinced he's going to be the next big thing in poetry, this Canadian, this quintessential Canadian, this indigenous Canadian who's attractive to both sexes and who seems the most interesting, brightest thing these great things have ever uh, met or experienced. His poems end up being typeset by Virginia Woolf. She handsets his first set of poetry called Poems in 1921. He's very close, as we know, to Siegfried Sassoon, but also to the poet Robert Graves and to Edmund Blondin. His work appears in Oxford Poetry in 1921. Graves edited his collected poems, which later appeared in 1964. The list of people that he either meets, corresponds with, or interacts with is, is really long, or just people that he's in the orbit of. But a snapshot of them all, and of course I've had to try and get hold of as much of the the letters that reference him as possible. Uh, a snapshot includes Thomas Hardy, who's a particular influence, uh, W.B. Yeats, D.H. Lawrence, Aldous Huxley, Lisson Strachey, the painters Mark Gertler and Dorothy Brett, uh, Brett paints him, uh, Harold Monroe, T.S. Eliot, Walter de la Mare, E.M. Forster, Ezra Pound, the Sitwells, um, further very rich people, Catherine Mansfield and her husband, John Middleton Murray. I mean, Pruitt was going to parties with Ottoline Morel and Chaplin, for example. That's, that's the, the level of uh, fairly gay and, and, and wealthy um, environment he was in. I call him a remarkable intellect caught up at an extraordinary time with exceptional people. Um, Virginia Woolf wrote to Lytton Strachey, 29th of August, 1921. The Times Literary Supplement says that Pruitt is a poet, perhaps a great one, and he's absolutely adored. To give you a little flavour of what it's like in Oxford at this time, um, I've just got this little a clip of, of Oxford life. This is the kind of streets that, that I have pictures of, of Pruitt walking along um, just at the, the beginning of, of, of the busyness of, of the, the post First World War uh, leap forward in transportation and uh, industrialization and so on. And this is Oxford. It's beautiful now, but it was possibly even more beautiful then. And Garsington Manor, where he's staying, is five miles outside of the town. And it's, it's like something from a constable painting. I've been there. It's, it's beyond charming. And he's having an absolute ball, it has to be said. So here he is in the, uh, I think that's the green room in Garsington, uh, being intense, but terribly poor, getting painted by people like Dorothy Brett, fawned over, uh, adored, and, and thought very, very highly uh, of. Eventually, he blows it. I mean, the title of this talk is called The Talented Mr. Frank Pruitt, because uh, I'm echoing a, a movie you may have seen called The Talented um, Mr. Ripley. And it's similar, really, a similar kind of story. Um, and maybe add in a bit of Brideshead Revisited, because it's someone who makes his way into the very highest echelons of society and then spectacularly can't stand it and self-destructs in the middle of it. I can tell you the whole story, but in essence, he steals flagrantly from the Morel who own Garsington Manor in 1923. And after that, he's forced really to devote himself entirely to the land and to agriculture, which is a deep, deep-seated passion of his. And he leaves to one side the poetry and the gadfly life of the aristocrats and the talented elite uh, of Oxford. He stays in the Oxford region, but devotes himself to agriculture. 
this is in itself interesting because his poetry shows him to be alienated from nature in many ways. He doesn't see nature as a psychic sanctuary the way so many poets did. He talks about himself being mad in the peace and emotionally numb and living a blue and gold existence. And uh, I compare him to Edward Thomas, um, the Welsh poet who, who writes fascinatingly along similar lines. Pruitt takes up something called power farming, which Canadians will be very familiar with. And actually he's sent by Oxford University who he ends up working for back to Ontario to learn what it's like to use the earliest prototypes of the combine harvester and use kind of precision methods in farming. Because Pruitt's seeing the future and he understands that we really need to take much more care of the soil and land and we need to think about what industrialization and heavy use of nitrogen fertilizer is going to do to communities and to landscapes, water flows, etc. He works, does important work for the Milk Marketing Board in Britain, and he works for an Oxford University group that's amongst the very first to bring in combine harvesters to Britain. And I, I can't underestimate really for you what how important combine harvesters are because of course they do work that had taken mankind so much effort to do before reaping threshing winnowing um, the first self-propelled harvester was introduced in canada in 1937 uh, but pruitt he's bringing that knowledge to britain and um, really at the forefront of thinking that that we're still grappling with now he gets married uh, to a friend of the daughter of the owner of Garsington and then abandons both that beautiful young deaf woman uh, and the daughter they both have in 1927. Then he goes on to edit various kind of um, country life type magazines, the, the Farmers Weekly, which is you know, best-selling stuff like the uh, an accompanying recipe book, Farmhouse Fair. And he, he keeps working in successive journals of that sort. But the big problem is that he's quite a drinker. Indeed, he dies ultimately with a whiskey glass in his hand. And that's his way of coping with the shell shock, with the trauma. Um, and he, he basically gets fired successively from various editorships. He's a brilliant writer, as we know, but he's not really coping very well with being a team member or, or running, uh, running magazines. So uh, next, I, I'd love to just uh, give you a picture of Ottoline, who's a really big part of his life. She owns uh, Garsington Manor. She's extremely sexually free. Um, extremely at, at this time, especially for her class. And she's very beautiful and an exceptional person. And um, there's a, uh, I think, a, a really good chapter about her. And she's someone that uh, they need to make more movies about. I think Tilda Swinton did a movie that featured Ottoline, but I think, uh, she, I don't think it's, she's quite been captured. Um, yet what Alphaline was like. This is Garsington Manor's beautiful, beautiful uh, spot uh, with, of course, this um, oak door. And uh, this is the, the pond where there was a great deal of scandalous skinny dipping. And here's a picture on the right of some of the shenanigans that would go on, of which Pruitt was very much the center of. Um, and of course, all of these rooms were filled with various of the great artists of the day, including Pruitt and Lytton Strachey was resident an awful lot. And people like Asquith would show up, uh, who took Britain into war in the first place and was held to be having an affair with Ottoline Morel. And um, we know that uh, Asquith and Pruitt were in the same circles. So it was quite the place, Garsington, 
And here's some more pictures. There's Yeats at Garsington. This is a uh, little stretchy down here on the right. There's E.M. Forster. Uh, there's Sassoon in the same room Pruitt was. And on the left there, you can see a picture with kind of the whole gang. Uh, in the middle at the bottom is Bertrand Russell, uh, one of the greatest thinkers of, of the century, really, with whom um, Ottoline had a long affair. And there's Virginia Woolf with Lytton Strachey on the top left, being terribly, terribly as they were. So Garsington, I think a very special place, and Pruitt, the Canadian, right at the heart of the story. And more people really need to know about it, I think, and, and how important he was to the, the birth of 20th century um, global creativity, in a literary and artistic form. So this is a, a little um, film just to give you a sense of what it was like in that transition period where Prude's operating and he's able to see the end of one way of relating to the land, here's someone scything, and he's able to see how important um, things like uh, combine harvesters, getting rid of the horse, increasingly mechanizing. He's able to see all this. And he, he writes novels about it as well, about this transition to get away from these old time ways of doing things. Bear in mind that the nitrogen fixing that caused so much death during the First World War is also feeding this great push that's feeding more and more people um, getting more from the land and um, that Haber process that underlies the, the fixing of nitrogen. It's, 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 its impact is enormous during World War I, but it's even more on the landscape afterwards. And I think it behoves us, and one of the good things about a interdisciplinary perspective is we can see that impact in different uh, areas of, of study and, and thought. I mean, the combine harvester or any element of it, absolutely revolutionary. And its impact was just tremendous. So here's our last poem, also read by Alex McMorrin. And this, in a way, I include, and the, the, the painting is also by Mary Herbert. Um, I included this because, in a way, it's not a happy ending, but it's Pruitt dealing with the trauma from being buried alive, from fundamentally the veil slipping between the living and the dead for him, him feeling that he's a cosmic speck, that he should die or he's already dead. He has lots of these kinds of thoughts that expressed in his poetry. But late in life, he, he writes another walking poem, what I call a walking poem, where he seems to glimpse that he can transition, as we all must, from being alive to being on the other side, that he can transition without fear and that he can avoid the psychologically chilling east wind which is a long history back to the Bible, the East Wind of what it does um, to the soul. He can avoid it somehow and stop it overwhelming him. So this is the cloud snake where he talks about overcoming trauma. And of course, he does fight patriotically in the Second World War. And he's someone who's never... He's not part of what what Fussell called the Boohoo Brigade. He's not saying, oh, poor me. He's just saying, this is what combat did to me. And this is my journey towards transcending it. Um, he, but he never for one second shirked from his brigade or from his duty uh, as a patriot. So here's the cloud snake. <laughs> Cloud snake. As I came at dusk to the hump of the wold, 
I must cross in the sun's afterglow. A black snake of cloud stretched itself on the ridge, and I was afraid to brave it for the valley below. Beyond lay the lighted lowland where I would be, and lighted behind me was the sister veil, dark only the ridge under the snake of cloud, and cold the subtle east wind at its tail. My shelter lies in the moonlight beyond. I am not daunted by a snake of black, so I run onward, so runs the cloud before, trailing the frosted east wind in her track. The blue stars dance before me and behind. Beneath them I know the east wind is not cold. Do not freeze and fear me on this height. I seek only to pass from veil to veil of the world. In case you're wondering, a wold is a uh, an English term for a mountainous piece of land with high contour. So um, the wolds is a big part of Yorkshire and he's out walking this landscape and he's transferring his psychological and emotional journey onto the walking that he's doing on the land. And this is a very positive um poem about him coping with trauma and doing what we almost do passing from veil to veil and doing it without being overwhelmed by enormous fear as they had been when he was shell-shocked in the first world war now bringing all this together what does it mean it's great to bring this character this person this canadian back to life and get hold of all the archives and, and, and go to all the places and, and recover him and put him where he deserves to be in the pantheon of voices in this period. But how do we assimilate that and reflect on history, deep time, what it means to be alive, you know, the, the, the big questions? Well, for me, I brought it all together uh, and, and, and sat and thought, well, how do we read this person? There's one option we can take. We can um, revel in the virtuous pleasure of judging him harshly, if we want to do that, and say, he's an imposter, and he's a cultural appropriator, and uh, he was that, and that is highly problematic, although... These are not words or concepts that, that were prevalent in his era. But it does seem very harsh to, to view him primarily through that lens, given what he went through and, and how his trauma led him to permanently adopting an Indigenous identity. I think it's more useful in the big, big picture sense to see Pruitt as an example of what I call soft primitivism. That is a response post-war to the need to recover an authentic sense of self and to resist aspects of modernity, to resist this enormous velocity uh, from the railways, uh, the velocity of change, um, the velocity of change on the land, the technological change. I think his identifying as indigenous is a personal expression of nostalgia. He used an adopted mythologized indigenous identity, a primitivist myth, as the way of resisting a world that appeared to lack any recognizable link to the values of the past. That's why when he's repatriated back to Canada, he's appalled. He's appalled that houses are being built without even a front stoop anymore, that there's no sense of Canadian community, that it's all about barbarous, he is, is in his words, consumerism, about what he called being a veneered American, uh, and that the, the Canadian sense of a nation a community that loved itself and had an authentic and inclusive 
um, trajectory. He feels that after the First World War, that's been lost. Now, I contrast this soft primitivism that Pruitt, I, I see as an example of, with other forms of strong primitivism. That's a, a desire to not be nostalgic and try and resist aspects of modernity, but, but actually thrust forward deliberately um, and, and do so by going backwards, by thrusting forward, by imposing the past or a version of the past. That is forcefully recreating or reinstating the past you could you can see aspects of this, I think, in the Taliban uh, enforcing a version, um, an a, a version of of a, of identity um, the, from the past. You see it also, I think, uh, in, in Nazi Germany, where there was a desire, an ideological desire to enforce a Teutonic vision of regeneration through eugenics. Of course, primitivism in both its strong and its soft versions is something that acts in a system of flow and counterflow uh, within the larger process of modernity. And um, modernity would be the, the larger, stronger force so strong primitivism attempts to impose a version of the past that's deemed authentic upon the present, whereas soft primitivism selects just certain aspects of it to retain in the present. And of course, both forms of this are doomed to fail because what's really at stake are needs and, and absences felt by the modern self. And these absences are made all the worse by war and trauma and acute technological change. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the larger big picture um, lessons that Pruitt's story can teach us. That we're always harking ceaselessly backwards because we do find the shock of the new uh, psychologically difficult and on that note I'm, I'm going to stop and stop sharing my screen and look forward to your your questions Thanks so much, Joy, um, for that really interesting um, presentation. I really liked actually your conclusion of um, kind of capturing um, Pruitt's trauma and life after war as kind of this idea of soft primitivism. I found that very, very interesting. Um, I just wanted to remind folks um, while Joy is kind of getting her screen um, um, turned off or stopped sharing your screen. I just want to remind folks for those who really enjoyed tonight's present or today's presentation, I keep on thinking it's the evening because I'm used to it being in the evening. Um, for those who really enjoyed um, Joy's talk, her book is available and uh, we do have it available um, for you at, at a discount of 35% off. Um, I have included all of the details on how um, you can um, go to Bloomsbury where the book is sold. Um, their website, and then also what discount code to use. Just click on the chat function at the bottom of your screen um, and you will get those details. For those who maybe tuned in late and got those and didn't see those instructions pop up, just let me know and I will, uh, I will forward it along to all of you. Um, Joy, we've got a couple of questions here. We got, we got four questions already, five actually, just a fifth one. I would encourage everyone actually, for those who are um, sending questions in to let us know where you're coming from, because we really like to do really like to know where um, people are tuning in uh, to this, uh, this talk today. Um, Can I just check Eric, I've stopped sharing screen, right? Yeah, you're good. Oh, good. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Yep, yeah, no problem. So we got a good half an hour for questions. Um, but I'm going to take um, precedent here, Joy, since I'm the host, and I'm going to ask the first question tonight or today. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell me um, how was Pruitt's poetry received in Canada, first of all, 
Um, it seemed to be well received within kind of this kind of British social elite, but I'm wondering how it was received in Canada. And the second question is, I'm wondering why has Pruitt, both the man and the poet, been forgotten over time? Because I'm a First World War historian, and I have to be honest, I haven't heard of Frank Pruitt before. The honest answer to the first question is, um, I don't think, I don't know, but I, I have no evidence that anyone noticed his poetry at all in Canada. Mm. He, I have to be honest, looked down on Canada terribly and was in love with Britain. He got back to Canada and he was repulsed by it and drunk himself senseless to escape it. And uh, he also played uh, the organ um, quite seriously, but he found it, it was almost like he was profoundly disappointed by Canada. And uh, he, he never did any marketing of his poetry in Canada. As far as he was concerned, it was an outpost. And where it was really at was Oxford and with all these highfalutin aristocrats that he found a niche with. So um, they were the people. I mean, in, in British terms, and that was the heart of, of letters globally at the time, was was Britain. He is published in major anthologies and he's up there with the big names and everyone thought at the time he was going to be bigger than Siegfried Sassoon and he would be the name that we'd all remember. But of course Pruitt has an alcohol problem and also he does not have money because his family um, they own a, a, a farm in the Humber, but they don't have any intention of bankrolling him or self allowing him to self-publish his poetry the way that Siegfried Sassoon did. So I suppose it's the, the, the need for a room with a view. He, he was not in, by any means in a position to make his name because um, it's the aristocrats who have the cash and and the, the great honor of being devote, able to devote themselves to the life of the mind. And Pruitt at one point says, you've all got your toys and I don't have mine. And I, I, you just play, but, but I can't. And he at one point steals the trousers of Siegfried Sassoon, who probably had 60 pairs um, and grew up in preposterous wealth uh, and Pruitt was threadbare and not entirely eating all the time either and had a young child later on and, and, and did equally badly then as was actually Robert Graves not doing terribly well at Boar's Hill near near Oxford so money walked and talked would be um, my succinct answer to that question also third answer He's way ahead of his time. No one's wanting to think about trauma. It's just like uh, after COVID, no one really wants to read poems about how miserable it was not to be able to hug your granny and so on. People want to forget after a trauma and they want to dance and party and, and have fun. But his poetry is about really, really difficult stuff, like what it means to be overwhelmed by fear. And uh, there's not a market for that. And he knows it and he doesn't care. He says, I'm not writing for the cant of this age. I'm writing for a hundred years uh, hence. He's writing for you and me right now. And he, he was fully aware of it. Thanks, Joy. Those are, those are some great answers. Um, got a number of questions coming in from folks. Um, the first question actually is from um, Sam Cowan. She's tuned into a number of our webinars in the past. Hi, Sam. Um, she was curious, Joy, about your distinction between shell shock and PTSD. Um, she's wondering what, what is the difference between those two terms? Well, the clinical definition of PTSD is that it lasts for about two years, for example, and that's not the same as shell shock. And shell shock is also a slippery term because 
almost immediately that it was used in formal contexts, people like Myers, the the doctor who wrote about it, were saying we should stop using this because it conjures the idea that something goes wrong in the brain because literally the brain is shaken, shell shock, and something happens in here because you're shook. And the direction of thinking was in the other direction that somehow it was to do with mental processes rather than anything biological to do with the actual cells being shaken. Interestingly, things have come full circle now and we are again thinking that something happens on a synaptic level that changes the plasticity of the brain whenever you're exposed to explosions and the, the, the waves that come to you, uh, in particular, uh, they've done studies on men inside tanks and what happens when they're blown up and, and how that affects the plasticity, the pathways of the brain. Um, so, yeah, the, the PTSD and shell shock don't map exactly onto each other, but they both are in the ballpark of what happens when you're overwhelmed by fear, completely overwhelmed by it, and you lose emotionally the ability to process it. Um, they're both in that area. I hope that answers the question. No, I think that's a, that's a great answer, Joy. Um, next question comes from Fedora Giordano, and he wonders if Pruitt ever wrote poems about um, his uh, Mohawk identity or about indigenous peoples in general? Or was this just something that he assumed um, is his identity and didn't write much about? Sassoon writes poems about him being a brave and you know, his quintessential uh, Iroquois, shall we say. Um, but Pruitt, funnily enough, uh, either because he has the arrogance of knowing that he's Indigenous inside, he writes um, from different registers. Sometimes he writes as if he is possibly Indigenous in the poem. Other times he's an eye kind of above everything, looking down and, and seeing... Um, seeing an Indigenous person appearing like a stag in a crowd of Canadians and how the Canadians are all reacting to this, this mysterious, animalistic, primitivist vision that appears amid the city streets. So there's the, the, the swift answer is it, he takes creative license to, to, to have multiple perspectives, but other people are very concerned with seeing him as this quintessence of indigeneity in, in 1918 in particular. And he plays up to it. Um, Rich actually has a question. Uh, Rich Mills, a longtime patron of the Military Center, Joy. Um, there's kind of a, a common practice. It's, you know, as, as you know, of kind of a, a long history of cultural appropriation of settlers appropriating Indigenous identity. Um, and mm -hmm. perhaps one of the most famous um, Canadians who appropriated an Indigenous identity was Archie Bellany, better known as Grey Owl. Um, did you ever come across any kind of linkages between um, kind of Pruitt's assumption of this um, kind of faked Indigenous identity and Grey Owl and maybe even others that were appropriating um, Indigenous peoples and Indigenous cultures? These are great questions. Great question, Fedora, as well, right on money. And Rich's question, that's exactly where I ended up too. And I, I wrote a whole section comparing Pruitt and um, Grey Owl and um, other imposter figures and giving my take on them, basically. Um, what they all share is they're all veterans they're all alcoholics they all hurtle through the class system using these invented identities the other thing i think and this is where i deviate from 
probably most of the literature, I can't help but feel some empathy for them because they're people who are heavily constrained by class or by uh, racial ethnic divisions. So Longlands, for example, and um, Grey Owl, you know, there's a reason I think why he was never outed as it were as a phony by indigenous groups themselves. And that's because he was a deep ecologist. He was one of the few people saying things that, that the indigenous communities that he had any link to uh, respected and wanted said, and he had a global audience to say it. So I just think things are, it, I, th I think we need to resist as historians, uh, anyone forcing us to judge the past only by the standards of today. And, and also I think we have a duty to be caring and understand that these people are veterans and, and veterans deserve our, not pity, but respect. and. Uh, they're fascinating figures uh, who, who don't take life lying down. And I can't help but admire that as well on some level. But of course, they're appropriating. And of course, it's, it's a lie. I mean, there's, no, there's no getting away from it. Joy, perhaps to pick, on, pick up on that idea, um, again, of cultural appropriation and this idea of outing, it's a very kind of you know, contemporary term. Um, but Heather Smith wonders if Pruitt was ever kind of quote unquote outed um, during his day. I found some records of, you know, people like Mark Gertler, the painter, he used to say, oh, he go, Pruitt goes around like a faded Hamlet, playing up the idea that he's a deep and brooding Johnny Depp kind of, you know, deeply indigenous person. Uh, but Gertler was in competition for the same sexual conquests as Pruitt. And um, he was one of the few people who, who didn't want to be fooled by the baloney that Pruitt was putting forward. And bear in mind that so few people had met a Canadian in Britain at that time. They were truly um, exotic. You know, they they... I talk about how in the book about how the Germans um, tortured um, some indigenous people, particularly just to see if they suffered because they were, you know, it was like a space alien. They really wanted to poke and prod because it was so unusual to, to encounter um, anyone from that. And, and Canadian was synonymous in many people's minds with um, indigeneity at that time, hope that answers your question. I, I wanna pick on that, pick up on that a little bit more joy as well, because I've, I've read that particularly in Germany, and this is historic, but also contemporary of a, a kind of infatuation with, um, with indigenous peoples and indigenous cultures. I'm wondering, was that kind of similar fetishization um, apparent in, in Britain? The Germans have a very particular take on the whole indigenous um, imagery and, and, and the idea of the Indian and playing Indian in Phil Deloria's terms, the Harvard indigenous writer who wrote that book, Playing Indian. Um, Colin Calloway's written a great book all about the German infatuation, Colin Calloway at Dartmouth. Um, and it is a very specific thing. The British, in my opinion, uh, their infatuations more the same kind of infatuation people have with the, today with Johnny Depp and and the, you know those very stylized version of indigeneity that he puts forward. It's um, they're looking at the time in the twenties. Remember that the British Empire is discovering and assimilating more and more bits of the empire. The world is pink, uh, belongs to the British at this time. And this exotic world, they're getting to know it more and more. And it's always in a mirror sense. It's a way of um, expressing things that are repressed in themselves. 
So, for example, I have a, a whole piece about the, the Rite of Spring Ballet in Germany and how it's also very popular with Ottoline Morel and the British aristocrats because they see it as expressing uh, an ing and the, a version of indigeneity that connects with what they can't express. And usually that's to do with sex, which is, uh, you know, we're still just getting out of the corset in this period. So people are projecting onto the indigenous identity, everything lacking in their life, including murderous desires, um, primitivist um, murderous ideas that they have for a cleansing and so on. All of these, um, they, they have this, this notion that the primitive somehow expresses everything that they're, that they're stuffing down inside themselves. And he's tapping into that and opening the spigot and using it to advance himself. Because bear in mind, Sassoon and Ottoline pay for Pruitt to get through Oxford and get his degree. Um, it, he's church mouse poor, and they're paying his, his whole survival in this period. We've talked, I think, a lot about kind of settler conceptions of indigeneity and, and kind of European conceptions imposed upon Indigenous peoples and understandings of Indigenous peoples. But Robert Wells has a really interesting question, um, perhaps flipping the script a little bit and, and asking if there has been any sort of reception amongst Indigenous peoples in Canada to Pruitt's poetry um, and his appropriation of Indigenous identity of the Mohawk identity. I talked when I started all this with the folk up at um, the Six Nations Museum and they were like, I never heard of Pruitt. You know? But a lot of the other Iroquois folk that I talked to, who do you know, Shawnee folk, uh, the older ones, they quite liked the idea that Pruitt was the only poet from the First World War who was indigenous that anyone had heard of. So before this book that I've just written, Pruitt has appeared as an Iroquois in the main anthologies of indigenous poetry and literature. And I list, I begin the book by, and, and that's why I started writing the book because I was editing the Cambridge Companion to Native American literature. And someone, one of the contributors, wrote the poetry chapter and they listed this Iroquois called Frank Pruitt. And you know, the kind of detective in me went, hang on, I smell something here. This is a bit odd, it was strange. You know, you know, E. Pauline Johnson, yes, you've heard of, and you know that she has Mohawk ancestry and so on. But Pruitt, um, nothing about it kind of rung true. And it, that began a story of fascination for me. Um, and then when I met his son, Bill Pruitt, he, one of the first things he gave me was a DNA test proving that his dad had not a smattering of uh, Indigenous identity. But then I talked to one of these DNA specialists in the course of this book, and she said that DNA tests of the sort that Bill had, had done wouldn't actually prove that because it's very hard to prove a negative. So to be perfectly frank with you, um, it's not possible to conclusively prove that he was lying. And of course, there is this whole tradition of uh, inclusion within Indigenous, some Indigenous communities and identity and belonging being measured by what you do that's approved of for the community rather than by who you are. So like I'm Joy Porter because of Porters and O'Donnells going back in, in history. Um, but, but in other reckonings, tribally, you, you are what you give. And uh, for a long time, Pruitt was the only 
the only figure that most people had ever heard of that linked to this First World War trench war poetry experience. It's fascinating. It is interesting because I know there's there's just been a lot of you know questions about what what constitutes Indigenous identity and you know there's been over time kind of settler conceptions of blood quantum levels have often been ways of identifying Indigenous peoples but more recently there's been as you said a push towards um, you know connection to community and kin as being a much more significant identifier um, of Indigenous community particularly within um, um, First Nations and Uintan Métis communities themselves. So I just I just want to be clear though, Joy, did Pruitt actually have, aside from claims to being uh, Mohawk, did he actually live in an in a, in a in a in amongst the Six Nations, um, or um, you know did he beyond just kind of appropriating this identity, did he actually give back to the community, participate in the community in any way? Not a jot. Yeah. Whereas Grey Owl, you know, he marries, he, he marries an Indigenous woman and weirdly, um, she rediscovers her Indigenous tribal sense of self through marriage to an invented Indigenous person. Mm -hmm. um, life is, is truly uh, ironic. Mm -hmm. No kidding. Um, I got one more question for you, Joy, and then I think we'll wrap things up. Um, the last question is actually from one of my colleagues at the Military Center, uh, Brittany Dunn. Um, she's asking specifically about your research into Pruitt and whether his adoption of or an appropriation of, an, of a Mohawk identity um, uh, and a return to primitivism um, was that a link that he explicitly made to his war trauma or is that something that you interpreted um, and a conclusion you came to in your research? No, I don't think someone who's profoundly uh, mentally traumatized is going to be in a position to be that self-analytical and you know come from a third place and say, oh, the reason I'm adopting this completely fictitious identity is because of ideas of primitivism he's too busy being overwhelmed emotionally by fear and um you know trying to get through each day without killing himself which you know, there's quite a few poems about uh, how easy he's a beautiful poem actually about how he talks about ki how killing himself would be like just opening your hand and you know the the little speck of life would just float away this is a guy clinging, you know, to survive mental survival after after being being in the trenches. He's not someone who's able to say, "I am um, adopting primitivism as a psychic strategy, and then I'm going to put it aside." In fact, he keeps it up all his life. And bear in mind, he's got the clut the the crutch of alcoholism that he's is keeping with him all the way through but um it's definitely the case that 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 i'm arguing this point about primitivism um i didn't show the final slide but i think we all do it we all cling to versions of the past to help us cope with the now so like on our computer screens we've all got a little image of a waste bin and a little when we send an email, there's a little letter. There are no letters, you know? It's just ones and zeros in this world we're in now, this digital world. There's no bin. But we psychologically need to cling to something from the past to help us cope with a sometimes really big velocity future that's coming at us technologically. And I think he was in a, at the interstice of all these processes and coping with change and putting it in his poetry. And I think he does his best, I suppose, as an intellectual and as a patriot. Mm 
and as someone who's faced death multiply, many, many times, to persist. And I think that's about all any of us can do. I think that's a, a really um, profound and spectacular way to conclude this uh, today's uh, presentation, Joy. Um, uh, Joy, there's been a number of people that just wanted to say thank you very much, Gord, Jackie, um, Jean as well, all of them have said thank you very much. They really, really enjoyed the presentation today, um, as did I. Um, Rich actually has a really interesting point um, just to kind of situate us geographically, because um, Rich Mills has actually been, been doing, has done research on Pruitt in the past. Um, very, very, very good um, historian of Ontario um, in the local Kitchener-Waterloo area. But Rich just mentions that Pruitt actually grew up just about 30 miles northeast of where I'm sitting right now. Um, and point. similarly, 30 miles northeast of, uh, of where the, the Laurie Military Center resides. Um, for those who have been there before, and we're hoping for those who do want to come back uh, to the center, we will allow you to soon, uh, once those public health officials and the Wilfrid Laurier University leadership team allows us to have in-person gatherings again. We're very excited to have that happen. Um, but Joy, I just wanted to say thanks again very much um, for giving us your time uh, today, this evening for you. Um, reminding, I just want to remind folks one more time um, that if you really enjoyed um, today's presentation as I did, I really hope you'll pick up a copy of Joy's book, Trauma, Primitivism, and the First World War, The Making of Frank Pruitt. I've included all of the information that you need at the bottom of your screen in the chat function, uh, what URL link you need to go to, um, as well as the discount code you need to enter in order to get that 35% off. It's Pruitt21CA. Again, you can find it at the bottom of your screen in the chat function. So again, Joy, thank you so much. Um, it was a wonderful presentation, a great way to kick off our fall lineup um, this year. Next up, we actually have Carla Jean Stokes. Um, she's a uh, a wonderful historian of uh, war photography. She's going to be giving a talk on official First World War photography in Canada. Um, that will be on November, whatever the first Wednesday of October at 7.30 p.m. is. I can't remember what exact date that is, but it's the first Wednesday of November. We hope to see you all there. You can register at Canadian Military History dot ca forward slash speakers probably the same spot that you registered for joy's talk we hope that of course everyone is able to come but if you enjoyed it as well we'd love for you to to, to share the word about these uh, about these virtual talks so please do so anyways i hope everyone has a great rest of their day joy i hope you have a great evening thanks one more time and uh, we hope to have you back again. Can I, can I say thanks to Gord and Jackie and Morley and this, all these rich, all these brilliant cement. I, I really appreciate all these points and, and thanks for listening. It's really, I, I've learned more from, from these questions and from the things you made me think about. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. The Q and A is always probably, is always seems to be one of the most fun parts of these webinars, so. Yeah. All right. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your day, and we will see you next month uh, on uh, the first Wednesday of November. Take care.